শুভজিত so uh, i just have to tell you a little anecdote uh-huh. uh oh <laughs> or maybe i'll i'll share it in my no, no, no you you can tell you can tell okay so the it's not very it's quite uh, you know course not been i so shubhajit and i uh, met each other just yesterday but uh, we uh, organized this whole uh, shubhajit helped me to organize this whole uh, school uh, in, in fact uh, part of it is uh, <coughs> Yes, I just helped with the speaker, I didn't know that much. Well, that, that was the, the bigger part of organizing the school. And also some of the ideas, you know, that we tried during these tutorials, etc. We discussed quite a lot, quite a lot with Shubham. So, yeah. Thanks, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so, I'm going to take a little bit of a detour. So I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to, since the school is about axonal transport and uh, neurodegeneration, I'm going to talk something about neurodegeneration. And I just want to say that um, my, my course has been a little bit different from most people and I'm actually also a neuropathologist. And I just wanted to, just, just I, I pasted this from my bio sketch, just to show you who I am and how I did different things. Um, so unlike most of the speakers here who have been interested in axonal transport since they were four years old, like Peter Passe, um, I actually did my medical training here and then I, I left for the US and this was in 90, the end of 96 and I actually left from Bombay. And if you look at my CV carefully, you'll see that there's a gap from 696 to 797, it's almost a year. And you wonder what I was doing in that year. And what I was doing is I was actually looking for a residency position in the United States, which I did not get at that time. So I was telling some people this story last night over dinner, is that what the, the way I turned up in biology was that I had no training in, in biology when I was a medical student. I had never held a pipette in my life. I went to the US, I could not get into a residency program at that time. So I entered a PhD program thinking that I would just join a residency in the next six months or so. <laughs> so that's how I became a biologist and then I finished my PhD. And we were really fortunate um, to make a, a really, uh, I think a really important discovery which has been alluded to by Peter Bass. Um, my PhD project was actually to show that neurofilaments can move as polymers in the axons. And since I found that out, I was, I thought that I might as well, you know, continue with this research thing, things, things were going well. Um, and when I finished, uh, I, I thought that since I already have all this medical training, I might as well do something with it. So I joined a, a residency and fellowship in, at the University of Pennsylvania. And here I was trained in anatomic and neuropathology. And neuropathology, is basically the study of uh, human brains and human uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And that's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today, about the exact role that I have, um, one of the roles that I have in UCSD as a neuropathologist. And then I did a postdoc and then here I am at uh, UCSD for the last five years or so. Okay, this is my lab. Um, if you go to the website, there are a lot of different stuff I, I have to update it. Um, but these are the people in my lab right now, we have a pretty small group. And um, actually my, the work that my lab does fits in, or the goals of my lab, kind of fits in really well with the um, ideas for this, uh, for this whole uh, meeting. It's just we, we kind of work on the normal mechanisms of axonal transport and trafficking. And then we are also interested in neurodegeneration and asking whether there are any overlaps between these two. Uh, different different uh, things. And so this is my second lab. Actually, a lot of people in the lab don't even know that I do this. But I'll just briefly tell you what it is. Um, this this kind of thing doesn't really exist in India. And I, I hope that by the end of the talk, I'll convince you how important it is 
to actually see the human neurodegenerative disease um, and how important it is to have a resource which you can tap into to understand these diseases, especially when you make a new discovery. And what the U.S. has is it has these collections of what they call Alzheimer's Disease Research Centers, and they're funded by the NIH. And since you have wonderful internet here, I thought I would just show you. So, so these are the Alzheimer's Disease Research Centers, and this is just the uh, National Institute of Health website. You can see that. You have, if you scroll down, you'll see that these are. These are the various Alzheimer's centers all throughout the country. So you can see there's you know, several of them in the East Coast, several of them in the West Coast. And what, what we do here is, uh, I'll tell you what we do here in a second, but what I wanted to show you again is the ADRC that is specifically there at UCSD, and this is the ADRC at UCSD. And we, um, so this is what we do. We have these different course that is supported by this grant from, uh, from the NIH. And there's a clinical core, and the clinical core is uh, composed of neurologists who follow patients with all these diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, what have you, um, for many years, often several decades. And then when the patients die, we, they, they donate their brains to our centers. And the brain comes, and then that's where the neuropathology core comes in, which is we, uh, we do a neuropathologic examination. And besides that, we also have other cores, which are the data trans information core, data management and statistics. You can imagine a lot of data comes in. And this is a neuropathology team, uh, which is composed of uh, three uh, people who are involved in, in this neuroimmunization. So this is my second level, besides being a scientist, which I'll talk about my basic science work with that, that later. Okay, so why do we need to do this? Well, I think we really need to look at the disease brain and ask what is really happening before we actually start designing our experiments. So that's one thing. And then also we uh, can do experiments in simple model systems to test and validate hypotheses that we generate from our more simpler model systems. So that's the other important thing. And for the rest of my lecture, I'll just focus on a different neurodegenerative diseases, and you, you might have heard of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, but there are many others that are also um, present in human beings. And, and I want to show you how we diagnose these different diseases, and then how you can actually um, identify research questions from just looking at these different diseases. Okay, so at the neuropathology core, what we do is when we get the brain, we dissect the brain and we fix half of the brain. We store half of it in formalin, and then we take tissue sections and do slides uh, and, and look at hematoxin and immunosin stains and also different immune stains for different disease proteins, tau, amyloid, beta, and sinuclein. And then we give the final diagnosis to uh, the patient family. And um, the centers offer also a very important resource for exchange of tissues between different sensor centers and um, there really are numerous research projects that are supported by an outside institution. And um, as far as I know, there's no such system here in India right, to, to do this kind of stuff. Okay. So this was the uh, talk uh, that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, is that how do you really, how do you really diagnose a, a neurodegenerative disease? You know, when you really get a brain from a patient who has let's say dementia, how do you really know what kind of dementia he has, what kind of, what is the disease, right? So how do you sort through the nomenclature, quite minor, also the confusion of neurodegenerative diseases using neuropathology? All right, so how many, how many neurodegenerative diseases do you know of? So, you know Alzheimer's disease? Parkinson's, okay. Huntington's, okay. ALS, all right. What's that? Charcot Marie tooth. Okay, those are peripheral neuropathies. Okay, I'm talking about central, central neurodegenerative disease. Any more? That's it. 
So all of these things, acronyms that you see here, all of them are neurodegenerative diseases, all, every single one of them. And it's, uh, they're actually pretty common. So Alzheimer's disease and, and uh, Parkinson's disease, as you mentioned, are obviously the most common ones, which you've heard. But then there are these other which I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, which are not uncommon. So they would actually comprise about you know, 20 to 30 percent of all the, all the pathology that you would see. Okay, so they're not uncommon diseases. And they're basically it's an alphabet soup. So AD is Alzheimer's disease, right? Um, I have Lewy body disease here because as pathologists, we actually call Parkinson's as Lewy body disease because Lewy body is the real pathology. I'll show you that. And then you have Pick's disease, you have cortical basilar degeneration, which is actually surprisingly not that uncommon. We have progressive supranuclear palsy. We have frontotemporal dementia with Parkinson's and chromosome 17. This is a rare disease. Okay, so familiar. We have frontotemporal dementia, which are actually fairly common. They are, they are the second most common disease, neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's disease. Then you have uh, multiple system atrophy, arteriophilic brain disease. There are some rarer ones. Okay. So how do you think? As a neuropathologist or the pathologist who's getting the slides, how, what is the central theme of diagnosing these diseases? You know, what what do you think is a common link between all these diseases? What's that? Loss of neurons. Loss of neurons. Yeah, but how would you? You can't. Uh, you can't really count neurons in a human brain efficiently. But loss of neurons is a good one. Loss of synapses would be another one. But for actually making a diagnosis, what would how would you? Shrinking. shrinking away, you can't really, you know, if, you, if you're getting a human brain, right, you have to have something that you can quickly see and diagnose from the human brain. You can't really count neurons. That's the, so you can do that in before death, right? After death, that's harder because you have all kinds of artifacts that goes on. That's a good thing. The person is dead, so you can't do anything anymore. So it's a, a different look to the disease brain, like um, morphology. Mm -hmm. Morphology will only tell you so much, right? So you have atrophy in most of these diseases. You have cortical atrophy, for example. Accumulation of some yes. So protein aggregation is the common thing between all these different diseases. And actually, it's such a simple thing. Of course, you're laughing because you know that's the case, obviously. But it's interesting sometimes when you put put known facts into words, right? So the protein aggregation, the reason why 90% of the people working in neurodegeneration work on protein aggregation is because of this fact. All of these diseases have one thing in common, and that is aggregation of protein, and which is a very curious phenomenon in my mind, which is that these are proteins that are actually normally highly soluble in the cell. Okay, I mean, there's these proteins, just synuclein, for example, is one of the most soluble proteins ever known. It's a it's a natively unfolded protein just hangs out in the cell. And and for some reason, in a disease state, these proteins aggregate in clumps and they accumulate inside the neurons or outside the neurons, as you'll see there. Um, and that's the central common theme of, of most uh, neurodegenerative genes, actually, all of them. And uh, these aggregates are also sometimes called amyloid, which is not to be confused with amyloid beta. So amyloid is essentially a biophysical property by which these soluble proteins aggregate into um, long uh, polymer forms that have a biophysical property that resembles amyloid fibrosis. This is uh, different from beta amyloid, which is a protein that actually also forms amyloid. Okay. So the uh, so the dogma in the field, and again, this is a dogma which remains to be proven for at least for most of these diseases is that the proteinaceous aggregates actually drives the pathology. Okay. So I'm going to tell you today about this simple algorithm that, that neuropathologists use by using just a few immunostains and to diagnose all these different diseases that I just showed you in the previous slide from um, a human brain. Okay. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit of uh, a story about this protein. Some of you might have heard of that it's a protein called TDP43. And uh, this was discovered in the lab um, where I was doing my postdoc. And this is a classic example. I was not involved in this. 
But it's a classic example of how neuropathology can actually drive research. I'm going to give you as an example of these. And um, at the end, I'm also going to have a quiz, so stay awake. All right, so to just go into the human brain, I just need to tell you the basic uh, neuroanatomy. And it's actually really simple. So all you really need to know to follow, follow the talk is that you have a human brain. This is the cerebrum, cerebellum, right? And it's the front of the brain, it's the back of the brain. And essentially the brain, what I tell my students, I mean, it's really simple to think of the brain as just this collection of cell bodies on the surface of the brain. And there are these axons that are going down and doing whatever the axons are doing. And that's a way to transmit the information, right? So your information is being transmitted from the top to the bottom, top to the bottom. And then there's an opposite loop where you have sensory information going from the bottom to the top. And that's all what the brain really does. It takes in information, processes it, and sends it right back. That's what it's doing all the time. And then this is a cross-section of the brain, and you can see that you have these collections of nuclei, which are also cell bodies in the middle there. And these collections of nuclei, all they really do is they modulate the information as it is going up and down. So once you think of the brain as just a simple circuit where you have cell bodies on the edge here, you have axons that run through the white matter, which is here, and then you have these collections of nuclei, which are cell bodies that have little short stubby axons that just go back and forth and modulate the information as it is going down or coming up from your spinal cord into your brain. Right? And this is just one. Um, one uh, pathway to show you how this thing is happening. Okay. So in the neurons, all you really need to know is that if you cut a section of the brain, you have laminations here. You can see this is the cortex. So the cortex means it has uh, neurons in it, cell bodies in it. So you have the neurons in the cortex, and then you have the white matter, which is this stuff here. And the white matter just has axons running through it. So remember that. And then as the axons running through it, run through it, you also have a bunch of cells here which are called glial cells, which are astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. It kind of just creates a milieu for the axon to be happy and just, you know, stay myelinated and, and all that kind of stuff. So again, so cortex full of neuronal cell bodies, axons running right through, and this is the white matter that should have only axons and glial cells. And then as you go in through the brain from the front to back, you just have different brain structures. But basically it's the same. You have the cortex right here, you have the white matter, and you have collections of cell bodies, which in this case is the thalamus that just modulates information as it's going up and down. Okay. So you have to know this neuro neuroanatomy a little bit for to understand this. Okay, so now this is a HNE stain. You guys know HNE stain, the hematoxin and the So just the stuff that is blue, all the nuclei will be stained blue, and anything that has a lot of uh, ribosomes in it will be stained blue. And the pink is just a counter stain just to show you all the processes, the whatever is rest is in there, it's going to be pink. And this is the surface of the brain right here. And you can see this little uh, sheet like thing here. This is, these are the arachnoid membranes that you just see them, you can cut them in the slide. So as you go from the top to the bottom, you have the arachnoid membrane. You have the surface of the brain, this is the cortex, and you have some blood vessels that you can see these are the red blood cells in there. And as you go down into the cerebral cortex, you have these cells, which I'll show you in high power in a bit, which are neurons. And then they, these are more pyramidal shaped cells that are neurons, and then you have smaller round cells, which are just uh, glial cells. And this is just a zoomed up uh, view from one of these sections. And you can see that there is this really nice cell. Uh, now remember, this is all from everything I'm showing you from now on, but it's from it's human brains. So this is a, what kind of cell do you think this is? This one. So it's pyramidal shaped and nice, long, apical, apical dendrite. So this is a neuron. See how much it's, it's way bigger than most of the cells around it. These are just really small cells. These are the oligodendrocytes. And this is a giant neuron in the middle of it. Now you're in the cortex, so you can see the neurons in there. Now the axons, you can't really see the axons of the HNE, but all this pink stuff you see on here, these are all axons and dendrites, all of which you can show okay. Now as you go down, further down, you kind of lose these neurons. And as I said, this is the white matter. 
So in the white matter, you'll have blood vessels. You'll have these lots and lots of oligodendrocytes or glial cells. And you really won't have any neurons. These are just axon neurons. Okay. Got it? Okay. So what we do is we take sections of various parts of the brain. And um, before I, I start showing you what we see in different neurogenic diseases, I just wanted to show you what you can see on a simple HNE staining. So in the HNE staining, um, if you look at this section here, this has been taken from a person with a, a neurodegenerative disease. Can you tell if something is wrong with this slide? See how many pathologists, potential pathologists are there in the audience. Can you light through some clear spaces, please? Yeah, clear spaces. Clear spaces can sometimes be artifactual. But also, if we, do you see anything else in here? Yeah, these dark pink stuff, right? Dark pink stuff, right? So remember protein aggregation. So this dark pink stuff is actually amyloid aggregation. But if you only do an HME stain, then what you see is it's very hard to see whether there's amyloid or what. It's non-specific because you don't really know what protein is in there. Um, and there are some other hints of Alzheimer's disease, which is this phenomenon, which is called, uh, it's a mouthful, it's called granulovacular degeneration. But essentially what it is, it's, it's a collection of lysosomes within a cell. So if you look at this cell really carefully, you see this is the cell here, this is the nucleus, this is the nucleus, right? And if you look carefully, you'll see there's little dots in here, surrounded by these vacuoles. These are actually autophagic vacuoles that are very frequently found in Alzheimer's disease. And this is one of the things you can see on an HNE scan here as well. And here, this is more classic. This is a section that is taken from the midbrain of a patient with Parkinson's disease. And if you look carefully, you'll see that this neuron is a little bit different than just these dark black spots in it, right? What is it? This neuron with dark black spots. Do you know what dopaminergic neurons are? They have neuromelanin in them. So this, these are dopaminergic neurons. And this is a pathology which is specific for Parkinson's and other Lewy body diseases. These are called Lewy bodies. And you can see on the HNE, you have a dark pink center surrounded by this clear halo. And these are Lewy bodies that are found in uh, Parkinson's, which I'll show you a little bit in a second. All right, so this is the, if, if you look at the whole uh, schematic of all neuropathologies in the human brain. It kind of looks confusing because you have a lot of these different diseases. But amazingly, just by doing three immunostains, you can distinguish all of these diseases. Um, and this is, I don't expect you to remember this algorithm right now, but this is the basic algorithms that neuropathologists use, where you can just do a tau immunostaining for tau. So we discussed what tau is. Tau is a microtubule binding protein. Whether it's a microtubule stabilizing protein or not, I think is the way to put what we talked about. Um, but the fact that tau is a really good marker for a pathology that's seen in Alzheimer's disease, and I'll show you in a bit. And then you can do an alpha synuclein stain that distinguishes uh, Alzheimer's pathologies from Parkinson's pathologies, and so on and so forth. So let's just first talk about the basic fundamental Alzheimer's. Now you might have seen slides like this. So basically, when you when you get a brain from a patient with Alzheimer's disease, you have this really profound um, phenotype. Now you know what's going on here. What's the problem? What's the difference between this brain and that brain? So what exactly is going on? What do you think is shrinking here? Atrophy. atrophy and the neurons are dying so he said that's good so basically the, the there's a loss of volume of the cortex right and the cortex is where the neurons are so there's a tremendous loss of uh, neurons on the cortex which is causing this atrophy so grossly you can tell that there's atrophy and what is amazing about Alzheimer's disease is that if you if you meet a patient with Alzheimer's disease in the early stages you really won't know that he or she has Alzheimer's disease. It's pretty amazing. So you would, you would carry on a normal conversation with this people, person. And this person would go, let's say, during the conversation, this person says, okay, what time is it? And you tell, okay, it's, it's you know, 5, 30 or whatever. A minute later, the person's going to say, what time is it? And then you start thinking, there's something wrong with this person. Or what? And then after, after a minute or so, they say, okay, what time is it? 
So this person just cannot form new habits, right? So that's the real problem with all animals. And amazingly, the, the specific region of the brain that is affected in Alzheimer's disease first is the hippocampus. So if you look at Alzheimer's disease in the early stages, the, the disease is almost entirely restricted to the hippocampus, which is a pretty amazing thing. So this gives us a very good hint at the correlate for forming and regaining new memories of the hippocampus. And this is how the hippocampus of a human brain looks like. So are you guys familiar with mouse histology? Um, you guys have worked with the mouse. So that, you know, the, so it's not, the parts of the brain are the same in the sense that you have this dentate dentate gyrus, which is also seen in the mouse. And then you have the coronal amylus neurons, the CA3, CA1, and then you have the interamal cortex. So this is just a cross section of the hippocampus. And I'm showing this because I want to just show you how the pathology of uh, Alzheimer's disease progresses in the brain. And this is a seminal paper from back in the 90s by a person called Brack, uh, which is universally used for staging Alzheimer's disease. So in early Alzheimer's disease, which is stage one, the disease incredibly always starts from this single layer of neurons in the internal cortex, and this is the, the layer of five neurons. And then as the disease progresses, you have involvement of the other parts of the hippocampus. In this case, you can see the disease is spreading to involve the entire hippocampus. And gradually, what happens is that in addition to the hippocampus, which is involved in the early stages, you have this gradual progression of pathology from the temporal lobes and to the adjacent uh, and sort of involving the entire cortex at the end of the disease. And it always seems to follow this specific pattern, which is um, pretty interesting if you have been following the literature where the new hot thing in neuro neurodegeneration is this transmission of pathology from one cell type to another. And uh, you know, this transmission has been known to neurodegenerative neuropathologists for, for decades because we know that this happens. So what is interesting is how this transmission really happens. So this is one immunostain that you can do, not immunostain, this is just a uh, uh, alkaline, it's just a molecule that binds to all amyloid fibers. And this is taken from an Alzheimer's disease patient and you can see that this is an amyloid plaque. So is the amyloid plaque extracellular or intracellular? Extracellular. The amyloid plaque is outside the cell. Right? And then you have the tau pathology. Now tau is obviously an intracellular protein, right? But it's a macular magnet protein. So this is a, if you use an antibody to tau, and I think Scott will talk more about it uh, later in more detail. But if you use an antibody to phosphorylated tau, which is a, a kind of a specific phosphorylation, and if you stain a, a normal human brain with it, you would find no staining. Not a single thing will stain. And this is an example from a patient with Alzheimer's disease. You can see this is a very small field. You're looking at a cortex. All these big, long things you see on neurons. And these are all tangles. These are all um, neurons that are just chock full of tau in them, right? And then in addition to these tangles, if you just take your eye away from these tangles and just look at the rest of the brain, See how you see this large number of these squiggly uh, accumulations of tau in them? This is also very typical for Alzheimer's disease. So there's this tremendous pathology of this tau protein that is found in Alzheimer's disease. But, so this is an immunostain for A beta in the same patient. And you can and this is the cortex, and this is the white matter. And I, I think you can appreciate that these are all amyloid plaques. And these, the, the brain is basically riddled with amyloid plaques. So plaques and tangles is the amyloid uh, Alzheimer's disease pathology. Right? So now you can diagnose Alzheimer's disease, right? All you need to see is plaques and tangles. No? Yeah. It's really easy. So you just find plaques and tangles, then you have Alzheimer's disease. So that's the diagnosis. So you, have, you need to find plaques and tangles in the neocortex. Right? But you can only detect it after the patient is dead. Well, I can detect it only after the patient is dead, but there are there are radio ligands that are uh, used in the US now. For the tumor For PET, yeah. And actually one of my fellow residents is the is the developer of this technique. Uh, 
see. What kind of radio? These are. Um, it's called floor area. Area. Let me see. These are these are pet labeled, uh, pet ligands. I see. But I don't know the exact um, uh, like structure and stuff like that. But these are pet ligands, and you need to. The patient needs to undergo a, a pet scan, mm -hmm. but and it binds to all the amyloid plaques. Mm -hmm. So if you have an amyloid plaque, then it has a very high sensitivity of detecting that amyloid plaque. Mm -hmm. So if you have a patient who's asymptomatic and kind of having symptoms. Then you can do an amyloid imaging on this patient and kind of predict whether the patient will have Alzheimer's or not. So yeah, you can. But yeah, the definitive diagnosis, unfortunately, is the postmortem. Um, but also, there's a learning opportunity from this postmortem diagnosis because you kind of know what the key players are. So the only reason people work on am amyloid and tau in Alzheimer's disease is because we know, because of just the information that I just gave you, which is we know that these are the two key proteins in Alzheimer's disease. So almost all the time, neuro neuropathology that kind of drives research in that way. So, I'm going to briefly go through these other uh, other pathologies. The, mo the other most the very important thing that uh, in the field they are, are these frontotemporal dementias. And and with an Alzheimer's disease, as I said, you might find difficulty in knowing that a patient has Alzheimer's disease because they have subtle symptoms. You will have no such problems diagnosing a patient with frontotemporal dementia. You know, these are the patients who are or people who are walking on the streets and kind of talking to God all the time, you know. Those kind of people, those are all almost all of the a lot of the homeless population, for example, has frontotemporal dementia. And these people just have bizarre symptoms. And so what do you see in these patients? You don't see plaques and tangles. It's a completely different disease. And one of the things that you see are these uh, thing called pick bodies. Okay? And this is a, a, a disease that's called Pick's disease, which is named after a neuro, neuro, neurologist to diagnose this disease. And in this case, you find accumulations of Again, tau, it's the same protein that was seen in Alzheimer's disease, but it accumulates in a completely different location, which is in this case, it's the dentate tires of the hippocampus. And it gives rise to a completely different disease. The patient will have no memory memory symptoms, no memory loss, but it will have, it will have bizarre symptoms of uh, frontotemporal dementia. So, so it's, it always fascinates me that there's the same protein that is aggregating in a different location and causing a different disease. And I'll show you examples where it's the same protein, but it's aggregating in a different cell and it's causing a completely different disease as well. So let's just go through that. Now here's another disease called corticobasilar degeneration. So in this case, the patient doesn't present with memory loss, doesn't present with bizarre symptoms. They actually present with things like gait problems. They have, they have problems in moving and they have problems with their gaze, eyesight, and they have problems with swallowing. Completely a different disease, right? It's also due to tau. But in this case, it's a very peculiar phenomenon. So if you look at the slide, this is the cortex, and this is the white matter. Now all the stuff that I've shown you before was tau aggregating in neurons, which are in the cortex, right? But look at what happens to tau in the white matter in these diseases. There's a tremendous aggregation of tau in glial cells in this case, right? It's still tau, it's the same protein, but it's aggregating in a completely different cell type and it's causing a completely different disease. Does tau express in glial cells or does it express in only neurons? Uh, you know, I think it does not express in glial cells, but this is a. Uh, I'm not sure of that. It's called. Do you know, does tau, is tau expressed in glial cells? Well, What's the dogma? In oligodendrocytes. So this is these are actually accumulations of and aggregations of tau in oligodendroglial cells. <coughs> and they cause a different disease. What causes tau aggregation? <laughs> Find that out, then you'll get a Nobel Prize. It's called That's a really good question. What caught me? What would cause, I don't think we have an answer to the general question that I posed in the, in the beginning, which is what would cause a perfectly good, normal, happy, soluble protein to aggregate in the cell? I don't think we know that. 
And obviously that's the driving force of, of many of these diseases and we don't have an answer, clear answer to them. One of the answers is is a failure of, uh, which is a good one, but the most popular answer is that there is a failure of um, uh, proteostatic mechanisms as we age. So remember the, the biggest risk factor for all these diseases I'm talking about is aging. And for some reason you have to get to, unless you have a gene for the disease, you have to get to 60 or 70 years to get these diseases. So the thought is that the, the protein um, homeostatic mechanism that just degrades the protein, controls it, sends it to lysosome, does all these things, gets ori as you get older and older. And then that's what is, so the tau which was supposed to be nicely degraded by the cell is not really getting degraded anymore. So it accumulates and then it aggregates. So if you take tau in a test tube for example and, and just leave it, it'll seed and aggregate. Same. Has it to do something with the lipid rafts because lipid rafts can then get there is some imbalance in the property of lipid wraps, like cholesterol and all these things. So it can make a generation of more of this one. Yep. Yeah, it's it's quite possible possible that the, the lipid uh, the disturbances of the lipids has something to do with it because one of the major risk factor for sporadic, I mean non-genetic Alzheimer's disease is a gene called FOE, which is which the only role for FOE is in lipid metabolism. But I don't think it's very well understood yet. Sorry. But it is true that in, in intro, uh, standard way of uh, precipitating or, or facilitating protein formation in the common cell, which does not require phosphorylation, by the way, is the addition of arachidonic acid. So high levels of Mm -hmm. So you know, it's it's again like Kushan, you brought it up. It's it's just very hard to know from the end stage end stage that you're looking at as to what exactly went on in this brain when the person was living. And so far, we don't have many volunteers for you know. <laughs> yes, completely different. If tau is getting aggregated, what is the change on the microtubule dynamics of the uh, neuromicrotubule? Does it affect microtubule dynamics as tau is one of, has both in regulating microtubule dynamics? If now in those patients, if you're getting aggregated, is there any change on the microtubule dynamics? Oh, yeah, so in retrospectively, so there's two things I want to say. So retrospectively, if you, if you look at Alzheimer's brains, there is a lot of um, change in the dynamics of the microtubules that you can detect even post-mortem. Uh, even with EMs, people have claimed to have shown that there are, there are just fragmentation of microtubules and things like that. It's just hard to get really convincing data from humans, but I think Scott, that's the second thing I was going to tell him, that I think you should hold your question for Scott's talk, because I think he'll be the best person to. So the complication in case of is in these diseases are due to tau aggregation or due to change in the microtubule dynamics? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> because you have to remember that the tau in our mouse uh, has a very good You do not need tau to get particularly good by the So I think, but this question is that, is the chicken or egg question, which just, I just can never answer those questions, which is that the, the, is the tau aggregation is a cause or effect, right? That's what you're saying. We really don't know whether the tau aggregation is a cause or effect, but there, there, the hint that it is a cause is that if you, there are many animal models where you can actually introduce a tau that is permanently phosphorylated and the animal gets, doesn't get Alzheimer's disease, but it, it gets a phenotype. So suggesting that phosphorylated tau is pathologic. So the but I think it's, itself is toxic in some sense. Okay, it's, it's not really Phosphorylated tau can cause, can essentially drive it towards aggregation. But the phosphorylated tau per se is not it. And you can get toxic tau that's not phosphorylated. So it's, it's 
But but so we can't see it in the human brain. So so if there, there are other manual models like Scott will show you where where you don't need to phosphorate the tau to get the disease. But I think you've also made antibodies to that, haven't you? For the for the for your yeah. Right, right, right. Now. And it turns out that there are several people who have made antibodies that say they don't mention the tap preparation rate. And then there's the uh, um, skip has made antibodies that sees a malignant form, mm -hmm. which has a distinct confirmation of the intermediate before the fluoride is made. Mm -hmm. And both the oligomer and the filament uh, see are toxic. But you can get toxic tau without having any filaments at all. Okay. So that's something that's what is it? that's a great question so what's the relationship between a beta and tau the best answers we have are from animal models, which from uh, Leonard Mookie's group, which suggests that if you do not have tau in a mouse, then the A-beta cannot be pathologic. Now, the answer is not that simple, but that's kind of his model, that tau is a downstream player and A-beta is an upstream player. So there's this amyloid cascade hypothesis, which I usually don't really use that word, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. there you go. Yeah, so that's a really hard field. So what she's saying is that if you have tau in the neurons, uh, and then you have tau in the glia in this case. It's probably that the tau has moved from the neurons to the glia. Actually, we do, that is not proven yet in the sense that we, have, we don't have an animal model where if we express tau in the cortex, you get it in the glia. It doesn't happen that way. So it's still very unclear where exactly this glial tau is coming from, whether it's actually endogenously expressed from, by these glial cells or whether it's actually coming from the neurons in, in this case. Mm -hmm. A little bit, yeah, but she was saying that this is just obviously a lot more. So how do you explain it? Is there any way we can promote the aggregation of tau? Yeah, there's lots of assays that you can do to promote aggregation. So if we promote that aggregation in a modern mouse, so in that we can study the future will not happen in that mice after the protein is promoted from aggregation, how do we promote Yeah, I see what you're saying. So the thing is that you have to drive it inside the cell and it has to go in the oligodendroglial cells. Uh, whatever that aggregating factor is. I don't know if it's been done yet, that kind of stuff. So, so that would mean, carrying on from the equation, that there's some sort of transport of tau between these two different yes. cell types. So is there any background regarding that? You know, yes, you I can go. That protein is, but if it is yeah, so if you can go to this issue, this week's issue in general science has a paper on it from Virginia Lee's group, Caroline Mack. Was done on. So there's a really hot field right now, which again tries to explain this that I just showed you, which is sorry, this phenotype, which is we know that in all these diseases, the disease itself starts from a very small part of the brain, and then you have the spread of pathology to different parts of the brain. So this has been known for a long time. So the obvious thing from this is that you have some sort of spreading going on of pathology from cell to cell. So they call it cell to cell transfer. Now, exactly how this, I, you know, I'm really not hot on this field. I've, I've read the literature and I find it a little bit not 
totally convincing since people use these um, in vitro models to show transfer. Now, what else are they going to do? Implement? But you know, when you have two, two cells next to each other, you express tau in one, you do see tau on the other cell. Now, is that a physiologic phenomenon or is that something non physiologic that's going on? But the one thing I would say that in, in all human beings, even you and me, we all have tau in our CSF. Okay, we all have tau in our CSF. We all have um, a beta in our CSF. So clearly there is a secretion of these proteins from the cells going on, right? But these are these have not been characterized well exactly how this secretion happens from there are secretion, but the accumulations are intracellular. Yeah. So that in case of tau, the accumulation is intracellular and there is a secretion of tau which actually goes up in Alzheimer's disease. And that's one of the biomarkers that most centers, including ours, uses for pre-mortem diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. You have, have an increase in the tau in CSF. Now with amyloid, it's a, it's the opposite. So with amyloid, what happens is your CSF amyloid actually goes down with Alzheimer's disease. And the people think that it's because you're aggregating more of your uh, a beta in your a brain. Part of the right, of right. And kind of a sink hypothesis. You know, you have a sink which is accumulating stuff. Yes, Scott? Uh, I, okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering um, what is the role of the amyloid That's, yeah, we can, but that's a whole another three-hour talk. It's uh, yeah, it's it's much. Yeah, it gets complicated because you you have to know the pathologies of these various diseases, um, and there's often an overlap actually. So in this case, if you look at the slide that I have really carefully, so this was a patient that uh, this was a case I looked at just a few days ago actually. So this is a patient who has CBD, I'm telling you, and I'm asking you to focus on the white matter, right? But look in the cortex, he has a few tangles. See this? So this patient had underlying Alzheimer's disease as well. Not in the neocortex. So well, that we have to again talk about. So most of the people, most of the, most of the time that you hear people saying that most people have tangles, what they're talking about is that tangles in the hippocampus, which is the stage of very early Alzheimer's. So what happens is that if a patient dies in his 70s and he has a few tangles in his hippocampus, right, that to me that just means that he, he's just going to get, he would have gotten Alzheimer's disease in, if he had lived 10 more years. Rather than saying that, oh, everybody has tangles in their brain when they're old. That's really not true. Am I making sense? So it depends on where the tangles are. So if you have a few tangles in the hippocampus, that's not Alzheimer's disease. You have to have tangles all over your neocortex to actually call a patient Alzheimer's disease. Right? And that's, I think, a distinction that is lost when um, the, uh, the basic scientist you know, kind of ignores the actual phenomenon. So I've often seen people come up to me and say, oh, tau doesn't do anything. You know, it's uh, there all over. And every human being has tau. That's <laughs> pretty much true. You know, tangles. You stated that uh, and tau are, so one of them is upstream of the other and then... I didn't state it, I, I stated the hypothesis. Okay. Don't get me into trouble. That's the, <laughs> that's the infamous amyloid cascade hypothesis, which uh, which has been proposed, I don't know, 30 years ago, but... But like going by that, then more often than not, it would be that, you know, multitude of uh, pathology would be present rather than one. Right, but she was talking about something else. You're talking about different pathologies within Alzheimer's disease, but she was talking about if a patient has CBD and Alzheimer's disease, how can you tell them apart? That was her question. So because aging is the major risk factor for all these diseases, it's actually pretty often that you would have um, a merging of two different pathologies, or even three different pathologies in these patients. Sorry, Scott, you were mentioning. Well, I was just going to say that it is certainly there are some that have a characteristic Right. right. Motor neuron disease. With, um, so there are certain ones. Right, right. But those are still, we consider them as one disease. Really. 
so if you have FTD and ALS, for example, that's an established connection. So the patient would have both of them. Um, yeah. But you also get you can have two sporadic diseases that just coincide in the same way. If you just get lucky. <laughs> just get lucky. <laughs> okay, so I hope you find it kind of fascinating as I do, is that you have the same protein tau, but you know, it's in the white matter and you have these really weird accumulations in oligodendrocytes and you forgot to these. I quickly go through these things. All right, let's see. All right, so there's another disease called progressive supranuclear palsy. And, and yeah, go ahead. So there are these yeah. 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 Okay. So let me ask you. So I haven't looked at it, but but you're talking about Aricept, which is right. Okay. Let me ask you this question. So how many? Um, so Aricept is a is a it's a drug that has been approved in the U.S. for treatment of Alzheimer's disease, right? How many months of um, improved cognition do you think Aricept gives compared to you? Two or three months. Yeah. So it's. But that's a behavior that we used to fire a lot, but maybe the survival. Well, so I can tell you that I'm sure that the plaques are not gone. That's for sure. So, um, so I haven't looked at that kind of stuff, but I'm sure somebody has done that. But the one thing that I did look at, which I found was amazing, were these trials that Elan Pharmaceuticals did back in the early 2000s, and they had this vaccine that actually removed amyloid beta from the brain. So you just inject the patient with the vaccine and they made uh, antibodies and the action of these patients. But the trial was stopped because uh, I don't know, like three out of six patients died because of immunological responses or something like that. So I think Elan has come up with a new antibody now, which is humanized and not supposed to have this defect. So we'll, we'll see how that, how that trial goes. I think they had I'm sorry? They use active immunization. Right, right. Right. Right, right, right. So I think that was a few percent wider. And now they're using the passive immunization. Yeah, let's see what the trials show. Yeah. Is there any? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So does our body how why does our body so she's talking about innate immune response to tau. I don't really know how much is known about that. Movies? Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right, right. But this is inside the cell, remember? So, you, I mean, if, if people have looked at all kinds of like ubiquitin and stuff like that for decades, and they, uh, it seems to me that there's a defect in ubiquitinated proteins in, in, a, in late Alzheimer's. I mean, but again, there's again this chicken and egg problem, right? So you're looking at the end stage brain and you don't really know whether this patient is just an old person who has just a defective protein uh, homeostatic mechanism or whether that was a driver in the disease. Scott, do you have a comment? Yeah, I was just going to say that the increase in ubiquitin is seen pretty much whenever you have Exactly. Yeah. Uh, in, you know, a variety of different conditions, including what they're blocking. Right, right. right. It's, it's really just a protein that has an ubiquitin that are aggregated. 
What changes happen in the cell when the DAO is... Like, okay, what is it? So, what exactly happens once the eye begins? You mean inside the oligos or inside the neurons? It is. And the... So, maybe maybe Scott is the best person to talk about it. And so, he's going to have a talk on DAO. I guess you should give your DAO talk and not the Aveda talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, hold on to that question. So, with the in, ca in case of oligodendrocytes, nothing is known. But in case of Tao, a lot is known, but it's not known to me. We don't tell you that. So I'm also I'm a, I'm a so this is not really my field, right? So I'm a I'm like a bird watcher for these things. Um, all right. So there's there's another disease called progressive supranuclear palsy, and these patients present with problems in gaze. So when they're looking at you, the eyeballs kind of wander all over the place, and they they are often um, sent to various optometrists to change their eye power, but there's nothing to do with their eye. And almost always you get this history that the patient just keeps going to the doctor, eye doctor, and keeps changing his glasses, and there's nothing wrong with the glasses. But what's wrong is this uh, really strange phenomenon again, which are called tufted astrocytes. Now in this case, you actually have astrocytes, which are full of tau. Astrocytes, again, are a different kind of uh, glial cell, and they're they're full of tau. And again, I want to uh, send this message across that again here you have the same protein tau aggregating in a third cell type and creating a completely different disease. So quickly, um, alpha synuclein, so my lab actually works in alpha synuclein, so we love this protein. So the reason why I don't like tau is because it's just so confusing. I mean you look at this thing, it's it's got this 55 different phosphorylation sites and you know it just really Mind-boggling to me how Scott did do it. But anyway, alpha synuclein is, is is quite nice. It's just 140 amino acid protein. We've been working on it for some time, and it's a natively unfolded protein, which means that it just hangs about in the brain. And for some reason, in Parkinson's disease patients and these other diseases called DLB and MSA that I'm not going to go into right now, you have an accumulation of these proteins in, in the cell bodies and also in axons and processes. And in this case too. Talking about transmission of diseases. In this case, too, there is a very well defined um, transmission of pathology in Parkinson's disease. So, when you hear Parkinson's, you usually think about midbrain pathology, right? Turns out when people have looked at a lot of these brains, the disease actually starts much lower down in the medulla of the brain. And there's a progression of pathology into the pons and then higher up in the brain. And the midbrain is just one of the regions that is affected by Parkinson's disease. So the reason you know that the patient has a, a problem, uh, or you've been told that Parkinson's disease is a problem in the midbrain, is because these are dopaminergic neurons that actually create a phenotype in the patient, which is the rigidity, hypokinesia, um, and the tremor, which is a feature of Parkinson's disease. So you can see if you have Alzheimer's disease, you have plaques and tangles. If you have uh, tau positive inclusions in other regions, you, if you have them in glia, you have cortical basal degeneration. If you have them as tufted astrocytes, you have PSP. And if you have, uh, if the brain is tau negative, then you look for alpha synuclein. If you have alpha synuclein, then you have Parkinson's disease, dementia with growing bodies, or MSA. Okay, so I just wanted to talk about this one thing, really. this is the last point I want to make, is this story of the DB process. Right. So, it's been known for a long time that you have these cases that are frontotemporal dementias, and people knew that you had aggregation of A protein in the dentate neuron. So this is, this is a dentate neurons, and this is just in with ubiquitin. So ubiquitin is like this marker for garbage marker, right? And it was known that if you stay in with the ubiquitin, you have these inclusions, the brown stuff that you see, in the cell bodies. But it was not known what this protein was. And how would you how would you really find it out? 
Let me just pause you this question. So if you if you knew that you have a disease where you have accumulation of the protein in the cell body, but you don't know what that protein is, how would you find it out? What is the stain here? This is the ubiquitin stain. So ubiquitin is just a you know, non-specific marker. So we know that it is an aggregate, but we don't know what the protein is. Normally ubiquitination would degrade. Yeah, so um, it, it does degrade the protein, but in case of in all these neurodegenerative diseases, what happens is that the protein gets degraded and then accumulated, and it's kind of a surrogate marker for an accumulation. The is it that the amount of the protein is so much that the rate of degradation is not? Yes, and exactly. It so it, it, right, exactly, exactly. It is marked for degradation, but not actually degraded. So that's why it accumulates. Okay, so I'll tell you the answer. Um, so what, when I when I went, so this was done in my the lab that I did my postdoc in, and this was this crazy experiment. So the experiment was to take these cases which are called frontotemporal dementia with ubiquitin. So we don't really know what it is, but it's something. So you take these human cases, you make biochemical extracts, you inject the extracts in the mice to make monoclonal antibodies. So you just have one person just doing this all the time. You take these monoclonal antibodies, whatever they may be, and you take cases with FTDU, where the inclusion is, and then you stain these cases with the monoclonal antibodies that you're making. You pick out the antibodies that stain the FTDU cases. You identify the antigen that binds to the antibodies in mass spec. And then you identify the protein in the ubiquitin the FTD regions. This was the this was the project. And when when I went to the lab, my postdoc mentor, she said, Oh, this was this exciting project. And I said, I want to stay away from this project for sure. So they would never get out. Because most of the time what happened, we just kept doing this. So it's five years. I don't know how many dollars have been spent on it, but there was there was at least ten people in the lab. The entire lab was working on it, except for me, everybody else was working on this. In this case, biochemical extracts, there will be many things, many proteins. Exactly. Exactly. Know. So most of the time what happened is that even if you did get a screening positive screen, it just was not specific for that antibody. And you just kept going on the circle. Instead of identifying the, identifying the protein, you had many, many hits. But none of them really, some of them didn't screen for all the FTDU proteins, uh, all the FTDU cases or, or things like that. So, how would you know there would be lots of proteins in there? So for example, in Lewy bodies, there is synuclein is a major thing, but there's like a 200 other proteins in there. Because remember, this is like, at the, by the time you actually look at this aggregate, this is like a garbage can. The reason we, we know about synuclein was genetics. Somebody actually found out that there are families that also have mutations in synuclein. So once you knew that, you knew that this aggregation cannot be a coincidence. But in this case, you don't have that luxury. So can you, by assigning deplete some of these genes, which might be causing aggregation, then you would come to there is less aggregation, then you can pinpoint that a particular gene is causing You could, if you could find a volunteer for human genetics, then, then you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> so so remember that, 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 that I think it was a just an enormous challenging project, but it was incredible that they did find the protein. And uh, this was this caruso, and this, I just show this for fun, this is the postdocs, you know, hanging on this ladder, <laughs> postdocs, this is Virginia Lee standing and directing them. So I what to do. Um, but they did find this protein, and it's called TDP43, and when they reported it, everybody said, oh, it's a non-specific, you know, how do you really know it's involved in pathology, this, that, and the other. But since then, the, we know that there are many families that have mutations in this TDP43 that causes FTD and ALS. And we think it's become pretty clear that this protein that they found with this incredibly unbelievable experiment was actually real. But also another take-home point is that, you know, that experiment could have never been done if you didn't have a brain bank and all the resources that they had at that time. Then. And so again, I show this for fun, but every time I look at TDP43, I find more citations on it. And this is not an old paper, I mean, it's 2000, I guess, a little old, but not that old, right? And the field has just exploded. This is like, I don't know, get this since we have 
Es un mensaje de Shinto mismo. All right, and it's been shown since then by looking at adjacent sections that the ubiquitin that we're seeing is in the PDB for the two All right, ready for the quiz? All right, so remember we have two immunostates. We have tau and we have alpha symmetry, right? And we have four sections. We have either the frontal or the temporal, which is the superficial brain. We have the hippocampus, which is involved in learning and memory. We have the midbrain, where we have the subtension eye neurons, where I say we have Parkinson's. And then you have the pons and medulla, which are the lower portion of the brain. So if you're wrong, that's fine, because I didn't, I didn't go through all my studies, so that's fine. OK, so let's say you have tau positive neurons in the frontal. So what would that disease be? Yeah. Yeah. So it would be high stage, track five, six. And let's say you have tau positive stuff in the white matter. CBD, wow. Good. See? You're a neuropathologist. <laughs> so I, I told you about different stages of Alzheimer's, right? So let's say you have tangles and plaques, but only in the hippocampus. Early Alzheimer's. Perfect. That's two and four. Now let's say you're looking at the hippocampus, you're looking at the dentate gyrus, and you find these really round inclusions of tau in the dentate only. What would that be? Fixed disease. Fixed disease. Fixed disease. Let's say you look at the pawns in the medulla, and then you see this. I actually didn't go through this in detail, but you see. So if you have tau positive large inclusions, which are called globus uh, inclusions in the pawns and medulla, it's a disease called, uh, called progressive supranuclear palsy, which I talked about that in the input, and I'll show you this. So let's skip this. All right. So what if you have the midbrain and you have alpha synuclein? It's easy one. Um, uh, let's say I didn't go through this either in detail, but let's say you have alpha synuclein, but you really have most of the inclusions in the frontal and the temporal, and not really in the midbrain. Then actually, it's a disease called dementia with Lewy bodies, which is related to Parkinson's disease, but it's a little bit different because the patient presents with dementia. And and this, I just said this, and you get it. So if you have TDP43 inclusions in the hippocampus, again in the dentate neurons, then you have frontal temporal dementia, TDP43. So, so all you have really is six sections of the brain, and you have two immunostains, just two, and you can diagnose all these diseases. Even you can do it. So that's what I wanted to do. So I hope we have sorted through some of the Nomenclature quite minor of neurodegenerative diseases. And I just want to end with this and we'll take any questions that you have. Do you need to perform the Absolutely. So, for uh, most of our patients, again, they have been followed at our center for you know, 10, 15 years. So the, they usually give consent very early on when they enter into our study, uh, when they have memory loss or something. Um, so again, it's, it's such a collaborative effort. So we have these memory clinics. So if you are 60 years old, let's say, and you have you know, some symptoms of memory loss or whatever, you just go to this memory clinic and you're evaluated for free because you know, we are funded by NIH. So we just evaluate them for all kinds of neuropsych testing, this, that, and the other, to see if they may or may not get Alzheimer's disease. And we tell them that, you know, if you come once a year for the next 10 years, then we'll do a free evaluation on you. And they're almost all of them do, you know, because they have nothing to lose, right? And um, during the course of that, we, uh, one of the, I don't know if it's one of the conditions, they could say no to autopsy, but, uh, we, we ask them to donate their brains when they die, and I think we have, our center has like an 86% autopsy rate or something like that. So, what about those patients that remain only because they have dementia, but they didn't die immediately, 
Yeah, the, the government just throws them out on the street, I suppose. I suppose, but yeah. they, they, they basically die. And yeah, so they die and we do get their brains, but from another source, which is the medical examiner's office. So when we get those brains, we also do the exact same stains on them. So we, I mean, I'm, I won't say all of them have it, right? But a lot of them do have, uh, FTD is a very common thing that uh, homeless people have. Mm. So that's how we know that most of them have FTD. But yeah, they they are not enrolled in. <laughs> so obviously, have a strong correlation. Yes. Yeah. So what basically you say? Right, right. So that's uh, so we do get their pain. So go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, you mean uh, uh, traumatic brain injury, TBIs. Yeah, that's that's a whole emerging field and it's very hard. <clears throat> okay. So, how many of you know about American football? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I was exposed to it once I got there and I must say that I started to enjoy it, which is really bad. And I thought that this whole incidence about uh, traumatic brain injury would lessen my enthusiasm for football, but it didn't. Anyway, so... What happens is that it's a, it's a pretty brutal sport where these people kind of, you know, huge 300 pound people kind of hit each other. And what, what uh, people found recently that these patients started getting like crazy symptoms in their 30s and 40s and some of them died. And when people analyzed their brains, they saw that they had tangles, like a tauopathy. And their brains kind of looked like the Alzheimer's disease brains that I showed you. Except that there's not many plaques, or not any plaques. Most of it is just tangles. And so I think the, the, the book is still kind of being written on exactly what that pathology is. But it's very odd that it seems like some non-specific traumatic injury to the brain can also aggregate tau and cause a tauopathy. Well, I think that's a good point. It's probably, I think, one way of thinking about it is that when One of my colleagues who's, who used to be next door to me at UCSD has this <coughs> incredible mouse model. So he has this mouse which he, he has a little like um, cage like this bottle and he restrains the mouse in this cage where the mouse, you know, mice like to run around obviously. So he restrains the mice so that the mice cannot move at all for, for just three minutes. And there's this dramatic increase in phosphorylated tau in the brain of these mice in three minutes. It's just the most incredible phenomenon, but he's done nothing to find out what exactly what the mechanism is, but you know, hopefully you will over the years. Yeah. So you describe just now the So actually, this is also this has also been seen in Italian soccer stars because of the uh, of they hit the ball so frequently. But one of the issues is obviously that it's ninety nine percent point nine percent of the players don't get it. So the number of samples is pretty low, and it's clear that it has been you know underdiagnosed for decades. So only now we are kind of starting to understand that this is a disease in itself. And so. So you have to have a repetitive brain injury. It's, it's usually not associated, as far as I know, with a single traumatic injury. You probably won't do that. There are a lot of people, of course, no, yeah. it seems like the military, you know, you have a uh, perpendicular uh, situation. Right. right, but the TBI, so the traumatic brain injury that you would get with one concussion is, is different from what we are talking about, which is that that's not really a telepathy, they get other things. So how far we can say it is different from the pre-IND and the progression of the disease starts from one to one point and might be some confirmation between tau and 
Like yeah, that's the hot thing right now in, 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 in the older generation. So a lot of people believe that that's exactly what's going on, where you have a DAO that induces a change in confirmation, but there is absolutely no data to support that. Whereas with prions, I mean, I think there's an extensive amount of literature to support that there is a change in confirmation of, of the PRPC when it comes in contact with the PRPSC. Not, not, nothing like that is known for DAO. All we really know is that if you inject tau in one portion of a mouse brain, then you get tau staining, which is very inefficient in other portions of the mouse brain that is connected. So it seems like there is some sort of a transfer going on. But I don't really like this prion, the comparison to prion disease, just for the reason that when you talk about comparison with prion disease, you're really talking about a specific phenomenon where there's a change of conformation of one protein into another. And First of all, I don't think that's what's going on yeah, with these diseases. Like, there's something, some change in the hydration of some tau and like, can we propose like this? There's something, yes. one yeah. tau is some hydration or something is going on and if it's inducing that phenomenon, another tau then in this way probably be on the list of so. Yeah, it's possible. We'll see how the field uh, <laughs> turns out. Yeah. Still pretty... I, I'm convinced that this phenomenon is real, the transmission, I mean, for various reasons. One is that the neuropathology, like we talked about, suggests that there is a transmission. Two, in our CSF, we have all these proteins that are there in the extracellular fluid, clearly indicating that the cell must be secreting them in some form or the other. The only problem I have is that when I, so I'm not in the, in the field doing this, but when I read papers from the field, I just feel that people are not really doing the, right experiments to address this. I don't know what the right experiment is, but I haven't thought about it too much. But um, what do you think, what do you think, Scott? I just feel that that field is kind of, you, they just keep talking about prion-like transmission, but I don't really see it. I basically agree with you. I think yeah. it's, it's something that can happen, uh, but probably it's not a major pathway for sporadic cases. Yeah. Say, Certainly, it's not a case where uh, the situation with the uh, telepathy is used. Oh, yeah. Really, they don't show the same kind of connection. Right. What you expect is that if that is the major pathway, because telepathy is, you know, it all shows the same kind of connection. Right. So, right. my guess is that what you're seeing is that it's, uh, you know, you have one population. Mm -hmm. That triggers with another one. So, I, mean, I don't think they've kind of experienced this thing. One or the other, yeah. So, but, yeah, we never can tell. It's always possible, but it just it doesn't seem to fit all the cases that we have. Yeah. Plus, as you said, many diseases don't have the progression anyway, so. Okay, so am, am I, I'm still going for the next lecture, is that what this? So, uh, oh, okay, last question, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Uh, as far as I know, they do not predispose you. And so there's, I don't think there's any, I've ever read anything on MS and any of these diseases, for example. No, no, not stroke either. I don't think so. So my answer is no, um, but I couldn't take the literature to be sure, but I'm, I, I think no. Because stroke is, you, you would find some of these patients who have strokes just by chance. They've had strokes in the past or something, but yeah, this doesn't increase the incidence. Now, epilepsy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I think aging is still the number one risk factor. That's the number one risk factor for all these diseases. So just, just don't get old, that's all. Don't get old, yes, that's what I'm saying. That's very easy. <laughs>
Should we take a little break and then? A tea is outside. A tea is outside. Thank you.